There is a macro cycle, something I call the everything code, that started back in 2008 when every single Mm -hmm. major government reset interest rates to zero. It was kind of like a debt jubilee. Like, you don't need to pay the interest, guys. We know there's too much debt in this world. (laughs) Every government reset all of the debts to this three to five year period. And what's created is this perfect four year cyclicality. Now, Bitcoin was born at the beginning of that. And it follows exactly the same four-year cycle, which happens to be exactly the same as the presidential cycle. So there's this kind of massive cycle that goes on. And usually, this period is what we call macro spring transitioning to macro summer. And that's crypto spring, crypto summer. They're all driven by the same macro factors, which is global growth is slow in some countries like Europe or China, it's really slow. Mm -hmm. Inflation is falling. And so, and then we're going into an election. So the chances are, is more stimulus. And interest rates are likely to be cut. That unleashes liquidity and liquidity sloshes through markets. So the Bitcoin halving is just part of this same cycle. That cycle is the liquidity cycle, which is the big macro economic cycle. So currently in crypto, there's 516 million wallets, Mm -hmm. but they grow at about 100% a year. So if that's right, we'll grow by another 500 million wallets somewhere between 2024 and 2025. Um, And that's a lot of new capital. So I think that it's a very big deal. It's come at exactly the right time. And then the market will start focusing on the ETH ETF. Yeah, which you know, by all accounts, seems like there's a reasonable probability that's going to come. Um, and so you'll find that the liquidity comes into Bitcoin; it'll flow towards ETH, flow towards other assets, and that liquidity spreads out. And you get what's known as alt season, which is where mm-hmm. it starts off in crypto spring, where Bitcoin is the outperformer. It's like the safe assets, like beginning of macro spring, treasuries outperform. Yeah, and then what happens is People get more confident, they make a bit of money, and it starts moving out the risk curve. And people in traditional markets will go from from um, treasuries to corporate credit to junk bonds to emerging market junk to private sector lending at the end of it, and then they all get caught out when the cycle turns. <laughs> the same is in crypto. Altcoin season is the risk-taking season, and we're coming into that. That usually coincides around that halving point. The thing that people forget it's a volatile asset class. Yeah, yeah. And in every bull market, you will have 35% pullbacks as normal. Mm-hmm. But that's a lot for any normal traditional market. And that catches a lot of people off guard, which is why you need to think about how you size your positions and your time horizon. Um, but we will have that. We'll have, a, have a, we'll have a whole period of three months where it goes sideways. You know, it falls 35%, trade sideways. Everyone gets bored. Nobody understands it. You know, maybe the Nasdaq's rick- ripping higher, everyone's getting really angry, and then liquidity seeps back in, and before you know it, it's off to the races. So you've got to prepare yourself for the unexpected. You've got to prepare yourself for volatility. Um, you know, there is no such thing as free money. Um, mm. And even though the probability is that the macro cycle is in your favor, you know, you've always got to keep a, your eye on, on the risk that you're taking. So how I think about this is I've coined it the everything, everywhere, all at once cycle. So most of the key technologies have been in place for a while now. Yeah. Um, in terms of the applications layer. But it's the, it's the adoption of the applications layer, the adoption of NFTs by giant corporate brands, um, the adoption of blockchain rails for a whole bunch of different things, from traditional finance of putting you know, equities or derivatives or whatever on chain. I think that is coming. I think we are going to see... With stuff like Solana being able to create a million NFTs for $100, well, that means Mm. ticketing or any high-frequency contractual stuff can happen. We're seeing Visa build on top of that. We're seeing massive speed increases again in Solana where we've got Fire Dancer that has a million TPS. That means high-frequency trading can happen. So you know, new centralized exchanges and the rails for the finance system, okay, that can go on chain. We're seeing large corporate brands building um, using NFTs and other Web3 technologies. Um, um, We're seeing the adoption via RAAs and the ETFs and other things. Um, So we're seeing a lot in the space. 
Um, and I think that continues. In terms of NFTs themselves, we're going to see a lot more use cases come. It's not mm. just about your monkey JPEGs. <laughs> but NFTs at the high quality asset side, you know, we're talking about Beeple or Xcopy and these kind of famous artists that, that are very expensive. This thing trades exactly like assets do in fiat world. So in fiat world right now, we've just, but it, the economy's slow and the assets that require disposable income, trophy assets, lag because nobody's got any money yet. Mm. And so if you look at the price of Ro Rolexes, NFTs lag the price because really they start taking off when the price goes back to all-time highs. And people are like, oh, look, I've got money. I want to go and buy a, a crypto punk because it's a social signaling status. Yeah. It's a luxury good in crypto land, much like a Rolex watch is a luxury good in fiat world. So I just think it's lagged. And, you know, I think prices have started stabilizing a lot of the NFT market. A lot of it will go to zero. I mean, Bitcoin, since, it, since its inception, has been the best performing asset three out of four years and the worst performing one out of four years, yeah. like clockwork. Yeah. The mass adoption of crypto, I think, is, is just an ongoing thing, right? How long mm. did it take before, you know, I use the internet versus the early adopters and stuff like that, right? There's a spread of years and knowledge and mm. we shouldn't care what chain we're using. Like, I don't care what mobile phone or what Wi-Fi you're on and what internet connection, what computer you're on, right? That's interoperability. And I think all we care about is we're using Riverside here to film. That's the application that we care about. All the technology underlying it, we don't care. But we're still so early in crypto that we care. Um, but that, that will change with better UX and applications. So, you know, I talk yeah. a lot about Bitcoin, ETH, Solana, some of the major token plays, but I tend not to talk about any of the smaller stuff. And my own portfolio allocation tends to be 90% in the majors. You could be like me and try and look through the cycles and say, I don't care about the mm. cycle because I'm looking for the five or 10 year. Yeah. Okay, you can do that too. And then you change your style to, well, when we do get the inevitable cyclical bear market that comes and prices fall 75, 80%, you add to your positions. Yeah. And then what you do is end up compounding returns over a longer cycle. And that works in technology stock, anything in a secular bull market, technology stocks, the Indian stock market, whatever it may be, it works. Mm -hmm. It doesn't work in cyclical stuff, really. Yes, you can get there, but you know, really you need a secular bull market and, and technology and crypto are both secular.